What was piracy in ancient Greece? How did it manifest itself in the archaic, classical and Hellenistic periods? And quite frankly, who can trust Odysseus anyway? Join me as I talk piracy in ancient Greece on the Ancient History Hound podcast. Hi, and thanks for joining me. My name's Neil, and in this episode of the Ancient History Hound podcast, I'm going to be talking about a subject which is very close to my heart, piracy in ancient Greece. And the reason it's a personal one is that the main source for this episode is Philip de Sousa's Piracy in the Greco-Roman World. And I studied at uni under him. In fact, we even had a book launch of this book at the university when I was there. He was a great teacher. In fact, I still remember him having a Lego pirate ship in his office as he scrutinised many of my underwhelming submissions to him. Anyway, the normal stuff now. You can find the episode notes, sources cited, and a full transcription on ancientblogger.com. And you can find me on Twitter, at ancientblogger, and the podcast, at houndancient. Finally, there's more ancient history content on my TikTok, where I am ancient blogger. Yeah, I know, you can roll your eyes, but if you can find some really interesting stuff there. Not just me, but lots of history, ancient history, and all sorts. But much more importantly, thanks for downloading. Podcasters are always told, just get more listeners. And that would be great, but I really appreciate the listeners I currently have. I have people telling me all the time to listen to this or subscribe to that. So it means a lot that people are taking the time to join me and listen to me talk. The plan for this episode is as follows. I'm going to be discussing what piracy was in ancient Greece. And this includes how it was experienced, how it was manifested, the practicalities of piracy and what could be done to counter it. As this is couched within ancient Greece, I start off with Homer and continue to around the 2nd century BC or the mid-Hellenistic period. And that's mainly because the discussion starts to move into the context of Rome's experiences with pirates. Therefore, all dates on this podcast are BCE. I'm going to begin with a question for you. What is or what was a pirate? A definition I found in a dictionary at home gave the following answer. Begin quote, A person on a ship who attacks other ships at sea in order to steal from them. End quote. This probably chimes with the definition in your mind, or at least an image. Let's face it, pirates have tended to exist in the modern culture through the book Treasure Island or the recent film franchise Pirates of the Caribbean. Piracy is also a much more modern thing, for example, cargo ships being targeted in certain trade routes today. But for the ancient Greeks, things weren't as clear-cut. De Souza points to three words used in antiquity, and they are, forgive my pronunciation by the way, leestes, pirates, and catapotinstes. You might recognise pirates, and this is the one which evolved into our modern word pirate. But both liestes and parates have a more general use as referring to a plunderer. It didn't have that specificity that the word pirate does in our time. Ironically, the word which did mean pirate as we understood it was catapontistes, but this is rarely used. Liestes was more common, and then in the Hellenistic period, parates started to appear. For the purposes of this episode, I'm going to stick with pirate, even if the word is somewhat anachronistic. You won't be surprised that piracy was practiced long before the Greeks had words for it. Correspondence dating back to 1350 from the king of Babylon bemoaned sea raiders making attacks on coastal towns and cities. On the Tanis Stele of Ramses II, there is a similar comment about sea raiders. The Mediterranean must have obliged those with a mind to the nefarious arts of piracy with some good options. The difficulty must have been to know who was a pirate and who wasn't. After all, the Mediterranean was crisscrossed by cargo ships and networks, particularly following the Phoenician cities developing strong maritime trade networks across it. This question of friend or foe is something which is found in Homer, and it's where we find the earliest surviving Greek references to piracy, though as you will hear, it was a bit of a slippery term. In Book 3 of the Odyssey, Telemachus, the son of Odysseus, has been given a kick up the backside by Athena, and he ventures out to find out about his father. He travelled to Pylos on the southwest coast of the Peloponnese, and to the court of Nestor, who you may remember from the Iliad. He comes across Nestor hosting a banquet. After joining him with the feast, Telemachus is asked who he is, and I quote, 
Who are you, friends? From which port have you sailed over the highways of the sea? Is yours a trading venture? Or are you sailing the seas recklessly like roving pirates who risk their lives to ruin other people? End quote. This line of questioning might seem a bit curious, but it existed elsewhere in the Odyssey. When Odysseus is confronted by Polyphemus the Cyclops, the Cyclops asks, And who are you? Where did you come from over the watery ways? Is yours a trading venture? Or are you cruising the main on chance like roving pirates who risk their lives to ruin other people? End quote. This actually isn't without some irony, as Odysseus has wandered into the home of the Cyclops and started eating his cheese, but more of that later. This formula of establishing whether someone was a pirate or not existed outside the Odyssey. In Homer's Hymn to Apollo, the god asked some sailors from Crete pretty much the same question, and perhaps with some justification. Much like the Cyclops, I'll be talking about Crete later. Early on in the Odyssey, Telemachus greets a guest, a sailor called Mentes, who is actually Athena in disguise. Upon receiving his guest, Telemachus asks a flurry of questions, and again, I quote, but tell me honestly who you are and where you come from. What is your native town? Who are your parents? And since you cannot have come on foot, what kind of vessel brought you here? How did the crew come to land on Ithaca? End quote. Telemachus continues with a few more questions, but by now we get an idea of what he's trying to ask without asking it directly. The reason he doesn't may lie in the characterization of Telemachus, namely a character who never feels that he's fully developed in the social context. It's actually something he admits to later on in the poem. If so, then this is a lovely detail. Here's a character not yet adapt to asking the obvious questions, very much unlike his father. Oh, and Mentes, or Athena disguised as Mentes, handles the questions with the nous you'd expect, even going so far as to reassure Telemachus that he is a trader, and even going to the extent of naming what he's trading. So, in short, no, I'm not a pirate, not that you asked me that directly, but just in case you wanted to know. What this suggests is that identifying a pirate wasn't easy. Perhaps there wasn't a designated ship type which would clearly define you or identify you. You might expect a military-style bireme to have been used, but pirates were about getting in and out and carrying as much as they could, so perhaps the ships used were similar to the trading ones, which would suffice in both speed and cargo space. The greetings also suggested that piracy was a central concern. There's no real need for Telemachus to ask Mentes or to be asked about his seafaring status, but perhaps those in archaic Greece understood this, or that it made the poem more relevant to them. It was the sort of thing a person might ask in the real world, perhaps not as directly, but still something you'd want to know. In a quite wonderful way, Homer shows us the other side of the coin and does this through a cover story Odysseus gives, when he arrives back home to Ithaca, Odysseus doesn't do so in style. When he lands on the beach, he has a meeting with Athena who points out that he's still in a lot of danger, and so she changes his appearance into that of a beggar. She also informs him that he should pay a visit to Emmaus, the loyal swineherd. When Odysseus arrives at Emmaus' hut, he is seated and fed and listens as Eumaeus complains about the suitors, even describing them as worse than pirates. Eumaeus then asks his guest to introduce himself, it's at this point that Odysseus invents a fictional backstory for himself. Remember, he's still appearing as a beggar. This fictional backstory includes a fair amount of piracy, Dan, I'll give a quick summary of it. Odysseus describes how he was the son of a rich man in Crete, but also an illegitimate one. When his father died, he only received a paltry inheritance and was more inclined to what he refers to as terrible things of ships and fighting. He describes how he led fleets nine times in raids on Egypt, making him very wealthy. He then joined with the Greeks at Troy, and though he returned home, his fleet was scattered by a storm. Arriving home, he immediately got itchy feet and set out once more to Egypt. He carried out raids, carrying off women and loot, and it was here that he met his downfall, being caught and surrendering himself. There are a few more dramatic turns after this which aren't that important, but eventually Odysseus, or his fictional version, found himself a captive and escaped whilst his captors docked to Ithaca. What Odysseus describes in his fictional backstory is the life of a pirate. He raided overseas and established himself as a wealthy man through this activity, and there's no sense of this being done as part of some heroic code. But there's also something very familiar with this story. The elements of travelling to Troy, a scattered fleet, the return home, and then almost immediately setting off again, well... That's a basic summary of the Odyssey itself, 
Later in the Odyssey, the real Odysseus will tell Penelope that he's going to leave Ithaca once more. The fictional backstory he offers isn't that different to how the Odyssey pans out. This backstory is repeated when the still-disguised Odysseus arrives at the palace, accompanied by Eumaeus, and is asked who he is. The fabricated tale involving his time as a pirate isn't the only instance of them being mentioned. One misbehaving suitor is rebuked directly by Penelope, Odysseus's wife. She calls out the behaviour of the suitor, which is made even more disagreeable, because they once protected the suitor's father in this very palace. His crime? Well, he joined a pirate raid. But there's another reference to pirates, which almost becomes a bit too meta, so stick with me on this. Earlier on, I mentioned Mentes, a sailor who was in fact Athena in disguise. When he reassured Telemachus that he was a merchant, he described himself as a Tafian, a people in ancient Greece. Well, that pirate raid undertaken by the father of one of the suitors is described as being one led by the Tafians. And in Eumaeus' hut, a slave is mentioned, bought by the swineherd from the Tafians. Even the repeated story Odysseus gives the suitors, which is much the same as that which he gave Eumaeus, includes an extra detail where the Tafians are again referred to as pirates. It's, it's curious how the initial conversation had in the palace, that between Telemachus and Mentes, involved Tafians, and one of the last conversations had there before it all kicked off also includes them. The only difference being that initially they are mentioned as merchants, but later on are pirates, and perhaps this speaks to the blurred lines between a merchant who might take advantage of a situation and a full-blooded pirate. And then there's that business with the fictional backstory. It may have been a narrative device to have it mirror the plot of the Odyssey. Remember that these poems were memorised and performed, so it might have just been easier for Odysseus' fictional backstory to shadow that of the Odyssey. But what if it was a comment by Homer about how close Odysseus was to being a pirate? As a Homeric hero, he couldn't be called one, as this wasn't the sort of thing which heroes did. But perhaps there's an underlying point here, namely that Odysseus' epic journey home wasn't that far from having the whiff of a pirate about it. And I say this because there are certainly instances in the Odyssey where piracy can be argued as happening. In Book 9, he raids Ismeros, carrying off both loot and women. A central theme of piracy, the acquisition of goods through theft, is something his men are very tuned into. In the land of the Cyclops, it's their first instinct when arriving at the cave of the Cyclops. And though Odysseus talks them out of it, he still sits there and starts eating his absent host's cheese. In the incident with the bag holding the winds, the rationale behind his men opening it is that again greed. They think there's gold there. And finally, what about the island of Hyperion? This was full of wonderful cattle which belonged to the sun god, and Odysseus has been explicitly warned not to land there in case they steal or eat the cattle. However, when sailing past, his men almost mutiny, leaving Odysseus to acquiesce but make them spare an oath that they will not eat the sacred cattle, and almost immediately you know where this is heading. In fairness, the crew find themselves in a state of starvation, but they do eat those cattle, or at least some of them. But Odysseus' account is full of how it wasn't anything to do with him. If any of his crew were still alive, perhaps they might have given a different version. But knowing what we do of Odysseus, it's difficult not to find him culpable in some way. Supporting this is that he didn't put up much opposition when his men asked to land. In fact, it's quite odd how the master of debate and wits puts up very little in terms of countering their demands. Now, none of this equates to Grand Theft Aegean exactly, but Odysseus' men don't cover themselves in glory. And remember, this is Odysseus' version, which is always going to be the account which absolves him of any wrongdoing and gives him the best possible light. However, there is a difficulty Odysseus has, namely that the acquisition of wealth and goods was a prerequisite for any Homeric hero. This was normally done through receiving gifts, but also through acts of valour. When Telemachus visited the palace of King Menelaus, he's in awe of the treasures there, and the king explains how hard it was to amass the wealth and bring it all home. The nuance was about how you went about gaining all this treasure. The more honourable means might be through defeating an opponent, winning a prize in some games, or sacking a city to avenge a wrong. Similar activities, namely gaining wealth through force and for the sake of greed, well, that was a no-no. In short, a Homeric hero couldn't be a pirate because what they were doing came from different perspectives, even if the acts they undertook to achieve their goals mimicked each other. Piracy, or non-piracy, wasn't so much in the act itself 
but in the rationale and context behind it. Before I go any further though, here are some words from a podcast you might want to give a listen to. Hello and welcome to the History Buffs Corner. The History Buffs Corner is a podcast that deals with the weird, wacky and downright crazy stories from history. Episodes range from how Roman emperors used fire to become rich, to Eleanor of Aquitaine, ruler of France and Britain, and many more ridiculous stories from the past. Every episode will be about 15 to 20 minutes in length, so you can listen on your way to work, or learn something new whilst you're cooking dinner. The first episode will be on how Linnaeus Crassus used fire to become the richest Roman emperor in history, and will be premiering next Thursday the 14th. So, if you want to be the most interesting person in the room, strap yourself in, clear a space in your calendar for every second Thursday, and let's get going. Because I'm Lily Aronson, and this is the History Buffs Corner. I know I say it each time, but I'm always happy to swap ads and promos. I don't have a marketing budget. So if you want to get in touch and talk about swapping them, give me a shout. Anyway, back to the episode. The Odyssey, with its nautical theme, might be the obvious place to find piracy, but the Iliad wasn't bereft of it. In fact, a raid made prior to the poem was hugely consequential. The poem starts with the debate over the returning of a daughter of a priest of Apollo. She was taken in a raid, but not from Troy or much near it. What then, exactly, was the rationale for the raid? This raid was doubly consequential, because when the priest's daughter is returned to the chagrin of Agamemnon, He demands a captured woman from Achilles to replace her. This woman was captured on the same raid. And if you know the poem, it's this squabble over women taken from a raid which causes Achilles to up tools and sit in his tent. I'll finish up with Homer by recounting a myth which was captured on a vase, and it's actually a very famous vase image you might have seen. It dates to around 540 and is attributed to the painter Ezekias. The scene features a ship in the centre with a figure lounging on his side, Looking closer, you might pick out vines growing from the mast with grapes hanging down from them. Below him, dolphins swim, and at first glance, it seems a nice peaceful scene. But remember, this is Greek Ark and Greek myth. The figure on the ship is in fact Dionysus, and those dolphins? Well, they were pirates. In the Homeric hymn to Dionysus, a myth is told which features Dionysus standing by the sea in the form of a handsome young man. A ship of Tyrrhenian pirates, often this word means Etruscan, though we'll come to this later on, spot a young man stood alone on the beach wearing a purple robe. Now this is an important detail because this item would have indicated that he was wealthy, and so the motivation from the pirates seems to have been to get him and then get him to tell them where his wealth is or where his wealthy friends are. So they jump ashore and seize him and take him to the ship, but as they start to tie him up, The reality, or unreality, sets in. First, wine ran in streams about the ship. Then, a vine grew up the mast and grapes appeared. The young man turned into a lion and a great bear appeared alongside him. The pirates leapt overboard and as they hit the water, they turned into dolphins. This myth introduces us to a reality of piracy which could be used as a narrative tool that people could end up in different parts of the Mediterranean through it. It was also a feature in other myths. If you've listened to my episode on the Oracle at Dodona, you might remember that one foundation myth for it involved the abduction of priestesses from Egypt. Before I start with the classical and Hellenistic periods, I need to give a mention to one figure who may have kick-started a new way to think about piracy. In the mid-6th century, an individual came to power on the island of Samos, His name was Polycrates, and he became a household name in ancient Greece. His renown was in part because of how he came to power. You see, Polycrates was a famous tyrant, and though this term probably isn't as pejorative as it is today, even back in ancient Greek, it wasn't exactly a compliment. And yet, tyrants could also benefit a city in some ways. A good case is Pisistratus, who was a tyrant of Athens and is associated with the founding of the Panathenaic Games there. Polycrates was associated with some big improvements on Samos, the Temple of Hera, a tunnel carved through a mountain to provide water, and an upgraded harbour. Though these do come with a caveat, it's not certain how involved he was with each of these. In any case, he did bring wealth and power to the island, and he did so with a newly built fleet. With this, he raided and intimidated the Greeks and non-Greeks near Samos. 
He built alliances and doubtless was able to influence trade in the Aegean. In a sense, he acted much like Odysseus in his fictional backstory, albeit in a real and bigger scale. Herodotus commented that Polycrates wanted to dominate the sea, and whilst it may have been a slight exaggeration, it wasn't exactly untrue. So what we have here is a sort of pirate tyrant who turned things up a notch, and using the practices of piracy as a sort of financial policy. Here the benefits from it didn't benefit an individual necessarily, in small group, but an entire island. And of course, it did make Polycrates very wealthy and very famous. So it wasn't all about altruism. Piracy, or actions associated with it, was something which could be upscaled. And in the classical period, there was a change in the political landscape of Greece, a new type of political entity called the city-state or polis. These were places such as Athens, Thebes, Corinth and Sparta, who evolved into more complex political centres, with a citizen base and their own way of ruling. They weren't kings as such anymore, and yes, I know Sparta had to be different, but stick with me. Instead, the citizen was the political element and involved in decision making to some degree. I know this is a very loose definition, by the way, but you can wander down numerous rabbit holes arguing what made a polis or city-state a polis or city-state. In short, these cities got pretty big and evolved into many states who interacted with each other. For city-states, the idea of piracy was just out of the question, unless, of course, it was being done to you. No one professed to being a pirate, but there was a lot in the piracy toolkit which these city-states could make use of and did. Next then, I'm going to talk about what piracy was in the classical and Hellenistic periods, how the city-states employed elements of it, how they reacted when it was used against them. But I'm also going to talk about some examples of how it manifested in a purist sense. By that, I mean away from the city-states and how pirates operated and what you could do about them. I'm going to start with Thucydides, a 5th century historian, who wrote the following about piracy in the years prior and how it still existed in his time. It's a bit of a long quotation, but I think an important one. Here it goes then. Begin quote. So piracy became a common profession both amongst the Hellenes and amongst the barbarians who lived on the coast and in the islands. The leading pirates were powerful men, acting both out of self-interest and in order to support the weak amongst their own people. They would descend upon cities which were unprotected by walls and indeed consisted only of scattered settlements, and by plundering such places they would gain most of their livelihood. At this time, such a profession, so far from being regarded as disgraceful, was considered quite honourable. It is an attitude that can be illustrated even today by some of the inhabitants of the mainland, among whom successful piracy is regarded as something to be proud of. And in the old poets too, we find that the regular question always asked of those who arrived by sea is, are you pirates? End quote. The last line, the reference to the question about whether you were a pirate, is now familiar to us. Elsewhere, Thucydides does provide some form of rationale, that piracy was done to support a wider community, and so we might think of piracy as almost an industry in itself, or perhaps aligned with how Polycrates used it. Piracy, or raiding, could bring economic and political gain, and in the latter of the two, as repackaged within how a state conducted war against another. In the 5th century, there was one such theatre of war between the Greek city-states and one which Thucydides famously covered, the Peloponnesian War. In this conflict, Sparta and Athens clashed, as did their respective allies. It started in 431 and ended in an Athenian defeat in 404. I should mention, by the way, that there was a truce during this, but in many ways, this was a war during which seafaring and raiding became an important element. When Athens fought Sparta, it had a big advantage in naval deployment. The Athenian navy was well drilled, skilled and numerous, and by the time they locked horns, the Athenians were committed to using their navy as their main strategy. In 424, Athens caused a sensation by capturing a small island near Pylos in the southwest of Greece, just off the coast of Messenia, in essence, Sparta's backyard. If you recognise Pylos, by the way, it's because that's where Nestor was based in the Odyssey. From this island, Athens established a base where they launched raids on the countryside. These weren't conducive to provoking the enemy to battle. If anything, they were quite the opposite. Athens didn't particularly want a land battle with Sparta at any time. Thucydides reported how the Spartans just had no response to this, not only in repelling the raids, but from his account, the Spartans were just dumbfounded by it all. 
To add to this, Thucydides also noted that these raids were very profitable. Years later, when Demosthenes sailed past with a force in his way to Sicily, he stopped at Laconia, the Spartan heartland, to raid and even build an outpost for any helots looking to escape. This last point firmly poked Sparta in a very, very sensitive spot. The thing Sparta feared and was paranoid about, with reasonable justification I might add, was that helots would rise against them. Sparta relied on the enslaved helot population. The state couldn't have existed without them. Here then, Athens achieved a political outcome, as well as getting some much-needed coin out of it. But there were instances where pirate-style actions were more practical. In 410, when Alcibiades made raids into the country of a Persian satrap, he did so for much-needed funds in order to pay his fleet. This was a fleet far from Athens, and so piracy became almost a requirement to just survive. And this aspect, the use of what I'll call pseudo-piracy for economic gain, was always an option. Athens was rebuked by Philip of Macedon in the 4th century for supporting Callias, who was plundering the trade ships making their way to Macedonia. It wasn't just Athens, though. The Peloponnesians, such as Sparta, got in on the act, and so merchants were in peril from both rogue pirates acting independently and city-states who backed pirates and most likely were behind them. Piracy became a sort of proxy war, which had a number of advantages. It was much easier to prosecute without committing to full-scale war against another state. It also allowed action by a state against another without treading that fine line of being seen as an aggressor. The irony was that while the ancient Greeks were happy to fight with each other, there was always a concern about being seen to break treaties or just act as an aggressor. Far easier than to weaken and destabilise an enemy through this pseudo-warfare. And don't forget good old-fashioned greed. In 355, a group of Athenian ambassadors captured a ship from Egypt and seized nine and a half talents worth of goods, a sizable sum. But Athens wasn't at war with Egypt, and their justification was that Egypt was in revolt with Persia, who they were on good terms with. Perhaps this nonchalance had consequences, as Demosthenes complained that it was this type of attitude which was making it difficult for ordinary Athenians to travel into the Aegean anymore. That said, he was still happy to fling some muck at Philip of Macedon, calling him the pirate of the Greeks. But that's Athenians for you. Though city-states publicly abhorred pirates, they were happy to use them both through support and sometimes in an outright fashion. Take the end of the Peloponnesian War, the final naval battle at Aegis Potomai in 405 saw Athens defeated near the Hellespont, far from Athens and Sparta. The message of victory was delivered back home by a Milesian pirate named Theopompus. Around a century later, the general Demetrius besieged Rhodes, and his navy was joined by a large number of pirates. Presumably, these weren't on the naval payroll, but were happy to lend a hand if they got a share of the spoils. And there's a great example of how pirates might be used, and also not trusted, by a general in the siege of Ephesus in 287. The general Lycon couldn't take the city, but was able to do so by bribing pirates who were actually defending the city. The leader of these pirates, a man called Andron, agreed to take some of Lycon's soldiers into the city as captured men. However, they were in fact armed, and were able to open the gates to let Lycon in. Though Lycon was successful, he was in no way trusting the pirates, and after paying them, he escorted them out of the city. And this goes to show how pirates may have been useful, but ultimately, never to be trusted. The traditional pirate, as per the example mentioned, could have a formal, almost business side to them. They were, after all, able to link in with city-states to act on their best interests. But they extended this formality to the places they have raided. Take Teos, a city on the Ionian coast, that's modern-day Turkey. Teos was raided in the 3rd century by pirates who made off with a number of their community. The pirates not only supplied a fixed amount for ransom, which they'd calculated based on their estimates of the town's worth, but gave Teos 23 days to raise the funds and pay them. In the meantime, a few of the pirates stayed in the town. This example provides an insight into an essential aspect of piracy, that being Greek didn't mean you couldn't be captured and sold into slavery. I'll expand on this shortly, but consider the business plan in action. It might be an option to sail away, but the easier option was to sell the people back to the place they'd been taken from. There is also another reason why this is a good option for a pirate, and that was because where you could sell those you had captured could get tricky. You might have wondered how and where the pirates were selling the people, 
and the goods that they captured? And the answer was pretty much anywhere. There are a number of examples of individuals receiving a claim from a community for paying a ransom for them. Eumaridas paid a whopping 20 talents for one set of hostages taken and even covered their travel home to Athens. Eumaridas was honoured by Athens and what makes this interesting is that he wasn't an Athenian himself. Eumaridas was from Kydonia on Crete. Now, Crete had a huge reputation for being the place where pirates sold their wares, be it people or stock goods. And you might be thinking whether Odysseus' pirate backstory was an earlier reference to this. Perhaps in the time of Homer, this was still the case, hence Odysseus having his fictional backstory based there. That there were no markets, or at least locations where pirates could sell their goods, meant that city-states could sign treaties. The city of Miletos had one such treaty in place in the mid-3rd century. It prevented anyone in Knossos, a place in Crete, from buying anyone who'd been a free Milesian. If they did, they were entitled to a refund. The agreement referenced 19 other locations on Crete which this applied to, but this only related to people, not material goods. This type of policy might extend to places literally harbouring pirates, and by that I mean allowing pirates to use their harbours. Back in 427, Athens had this in place with both Mytilene and Haliasis, which stated that neither could allow pirates to use their harbours. It wasn't just Crete, I should also mention the island of Aegina, which sits between Athens and the Peloponnese. This also had a reputation for a place pirates might sell their goods, and while you might think this to be counterproductive, it might have been helpful for those paying ransom to know where they should be headed, or see if they had contacts in that location who could help them. Perhaps this was how an Athenian Nikostrasos was ransomed. In a turn of irony, he'd been captured by pirates whilst tracking down runaway slaves, and himself sold as one before the ransom was eventually paid. Of course, the more immediate option was to counter the pirates directly through force. At the beginning of the Peloponnesian War, Athens went to the lengths of fortifying a location on the eastern coast of Greece, near Locris, to keep Euboea safe from raids. Further still, they sent six ships to modern-day southern Turkey to prevent pirates from attacking a vital trade route. A character called Deutimos was mentioned in Athenian naval records of 355, having been given the mission of guarding against pirates, though it doesn't say much more or anything about who the pirates were or where he was based. And speaking of named individuals, Polymarchos was one of three brothers killed fighting pirates and named on a monument at Rhodes in the 3rd century. A final named individual was Epicares. He was in charge of coastal defence in northeast Attica. This was the region which Athens sat in, and in the 3rd century he made a deal with the pirates to return those they had taken. The cost came to 120 drachma each. Now this might have nestled with the other counts of ransom being paid where it knelt for his next actions. Punishment was dealt not to the pirates, but to those locally who'd worked with the pirates. The implications were that some of those locals had tipped the pirates off to an easy hit, perhaps a community who were more easily raided, or perhaps a day when a group of people would be in a set location. Another strategy, albeit a costly one, to sending ships against pirates was to found a colony or base to make shipping safe, a sort of upgrade on what Athens did for Euboea. Step forward then Dionysus II, or Younger of Syracuse. He founded two colonies in southern Italy to allow for safe trade between Greece and Sicily. The seas between Greece and Italy had a reputation for piracy, and a word often used in the context of pirates was Tyrrhenian. This is often used to describe Etruscans, but it's likely that this was a catch-all term to describe the pirates in or around the Italian peninsula. In conclusion, piracy was a genuine issue for the peoples of the archaic, classical and Hellenistic periods. It's notable that throughout all these periods we have references in literature. There's Homer, who we've covered, but the tragedies and comedies of classical Greece mention pirates as do the comedies of the Hellenistic period. In the later comedies, piracy was a plot device, explaining or given rationale as to why a character was far away from home. Though it exists after the timescale for this episode, a special mention must go to the ancient word called Kalerai, which has pirates as a crucial plot device. And if you get the chance, I'd advise reading it. If you've listened to my Fantasy Dinner Guests episode, you'd have heard a great pitch on it by Helen McVeigh. Piracy has been argued as almost an industry within itself, particularly relevant to acquiring people to sell as slaves. In one sense, it must have been terrifying knowing that you could be snatched and taken away. How often this occurred, we can't know. 
but the idea of it as a possibility is itself haunting. The Greek response to this was inventive, from establishing patrols, founding cities, to legal agreements, but ultimately this can only have nibbled at it. And there's the argument that piracy was in fact useful for the powers in those periods. It had political usefulness, and as such, perhaps the attempt was never the eradication of it, but instead utilising it against your enemies. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. You know what I'm going to say next. Review if you can, come and say hi, but more importantly, and as ever, keep safe and stay well.